Today we're going to pick up where we left off, and hopefully today we will finish the, the basics of making sound. And there's three primary topics I want to cover today. One of them is envelopes, one of them is multi-channel signals, and finally a pair of classes named synth and synth def. And we'll cover some auxiliary topics along the way as well. So, but first, there's, there's one thing I meant to mention last week. Um, and I think I forgot. And it's when you, when you make a sound function, like, uh, well, let's boot the server. And I'm just, this is our, this is our ocean waves from, from last time. This is just a pink noise, the amplitude of which is modulated by a sine wave. And let's just make a slightly different version of this. Uh, maybe a significantly different version. Let's say sig zero, sig one, and sig. So um, if uh, sig zero is uh, pink noise and sig one is a sine wave, and we create this function and play it, we will hear only the sine wave. And if we swap the order, oops, like that, then we will hear only the pink noise. This is because when we play a function of eugens, uh, the interpreter interprets the last expression to be the signal that we want to output. And when we play this, uh, it's important to remember that this unit generator still exists and still is consuming CPU power. It's being calculated. It's just not being heard. So uh, when you're working in this kind of context and you're playing a function, you just want to remember to put the thing you actually want to hear as the very last statement. And if that is the sum of these two unit generators, you actually have to um, add them together, like this. And in this case, we, we don't even really need this third variable. It's sort of, we, we could use it if we want, but we don't have to. As long as the expression, the last expression, is the thing we want to hear, then that's all well and good. So that's the takeaway here. The last expression of a function is the thing that gets output. And that's all I wanted to say about that. So back to this example here, I want to pick up where we left off talking about uh, mull and add. Uh, mull is a value multiplied by every sample in the output signal, and add is a value added to every sample in the output signal. Uh, so we have a sine wave running at the control rate with a frequency of 1 over 4 hertz. It has a phase of 3 pi over 2, which causes it its uh, wave shape to be offset in time, so it actually begins three quarters of the way through the cycle. And then we have this mull and add. And the reason we have, um, just to recap, the reason we have the phase like this is because if we go ahead and plot this, forgetting about mull and add for a second, uh, if we just set the phase to zero, and we'll speed this up for convenience. Whoa, let's do audio rate, right? high quality signal. Uh, with the default phase, here's, here's one cycle. And if you say phase zero, this is the point where the wave will begin. Uh, pi over two, and it begins uh, here, one quarter cycle, right? this, this maximum point here, that's where it begins. So three pi over two causes it to begin here at its lowest point. Does this all make sense to everybody? The idea of phase and, and shifting where in one cycle we begin. So that's what's happening with phase. Uh, now the default range of most unit generators is either, it's, it's nominal, which means it, it's either negative one to positive one for bipolar signals. And some, some unit generators are unipolar, so they range from zero to one. And these values are not always the values we want when we're doing signal modulation. Like um, in this case, what I want is this sine wave to range from zero to one. And so by scaling the output by 0.5 and then adding 0.5, 
this shifts the signal where we want it to be. And just to be extra clear, I'm going to draw a picture here. So normally, here's what we'll even do it with our phase offset. So this is our normal waveform. It starts at its lowest point, negative 1, uh, negative 1, and here's positive 1. So this is our signal if we get rid of mull and add. Now when, we, when, the, when the mull value of 0.5 is applied, the result is this. because every sample value is reduced by half, so it gets halfway closer to the horizontal axis. Then we add 0.5, and that shifts it up. This, negative, this value of negative 0.5 becomes 0. This value of 0 becomes 0.5. This value of 0.5 becomes 1. So the whole thing just kind of does this. Let's see if I can, right, this kind of thing. A little bit sloppy, but you get the idea. So after mull and add are applied, the range is 0 to 1, and that's the shape. Good? Now, with that in mind, I want to emphasize that this is a kind of a clumsy way of specifying the range of a signal because it requires this sort of mental math. I mean, so, you know, if, we want, if we want the range to be between 432 and 976, I mean, that's a really annoying calculation to have to make. So there's a much better alternative to uh, fumbling around with mull and add, and that is to say dot range 0, 1. And this does the math for you. Uh, it, it assumes that the range of its receiver is normal, right? either negative to positive 1 or 0 to 1, and it, it handles all that math for us. So this uh, produces the exact same result, but I think this is a lot better in terms of options because the range is explicitly spelled out in the code. So, same thing. There are, um, there's another one, for example, unipolar, and you just specify one number and it will set the range to be between zero and that number. There's also um, you know, bipolar, which will be between negative and positive, this value. It's not what we want in this case, but just explaining how it works. And there's also exp range, uh, which will, um, again, you provide you know, a minimum and a maximum, and it will uh, sort of specify this range, but then bend the waveform to, so that it has a sort of exponential shape. I think this is probably best done with, uh, uh, we can plot this again, just to, to show you how this works. Uh, we'll put that back to the way we had it. So if we say I'll say uh, 1 to 4. And it looks the same, but if you look carefully uh, you know, over here on the uh, vertical axis, you can see that you can't really see the 1, but you can imagine there's a 1 down here. And there's a four. So it's done the range mapping for us. And range is just a linear mapping, just sort of a linear map from A to B. And if we say X range, it looks a little bendy, right? So it's been kind of warped uh, so that we have a sort of more exponential shape from 0 to 1. What you can't do is include or cross 0 in an exponential range. This just doesn't work. Um, and I think we've, we've seen a similar thing with exp rand. We want to pick a random value between a and b. This is perfectly fine, but if the range includes or crosses 0, the math fails. I think it basically involves complex numbers or something like that, which it's, you know. So you have to, um, you have to work around this. So any, any sort of exponential behavior in supercollider usually means 0 is, can't be part of the equation. So just, just to put this into context, uh, let's take um, this function and let's just make another one. So if we want to uh, make a sine wave that goes wee, 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 or something like that, right? let's, let's do that. So our signal is going to be a sine wave. And you know, we'll, we'll put it at um, uh, 
300 hertz. And our modulator is going to be what well, I said. So I said wee 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 wee. That's probably like five five wee's per second, maybe. And phase is not so much of an issue here. You know, we don't really need to begin at the low or the high. We just want some wee wee wee's happening. And we can just say, you know, give us give us a range. Let's let's go uh, bipolar uh, two hundred. Now this means the output range of this signal. It's going to be negative 200 to positive 200. Now, if we were to make this audio rate and play it, that'd be kind of a disaster because that's 200 times the amplitude of a nominally loud signal. But when we're using it as a frequency modulator, this is a perfectly reasonable range. And we can just say, add the modulator to this value. So remember, this signal has a minimum of 200 and a maximum of, a minimum of negative 200, maximum of positive 200. And when we add that value to this 300, the resulting frequency of this modulated sine wave goes from negative 100, no, positive 100 to positive 500, because we're alternatingly, we're, we're, we're adding the sine wave to it with that particular range. So that's going to sound uh, like this. That is clipping a lot. And it's because of this. <laughs> uh, my apologies. OK. I, this is, that was entirely my fault. One thousand apologies. Please forgive me. That's, uh, I was like, that doesn't sound right at all. OK. Well, it at least it's helpful to know what to avoid. So yeah. you taught us something. I, I did exactly the disaster I described a few seconds ago. Yes. No, we don't need it. It's just, just another thing that got copied. Yeah, we don't need that at all. But we could, for example, make an argument for mod width if we wanted, or something like this. Uh, uh, we can go 100. We can do something a little crazier. Yeah. You know, with, with something really big, we're actually modulating the frequency so much that it actually goes past zero into the negatives. And SineOSC sin doesn't mind a negative frequency, but other unit generators will get grouchy if you give them negative frequencies. So um, I, like LF, a lot of the LF oscillators, for example, do weird stuff if they get a negative frequency. But it's okay with sine waves. Okay. Um, so I think the bottom line here is, is that just um, th this range method uh, or any of the range adjacent methods, very handy for specifying the minimum and maximum range of an output signal, depending on how you want to use it, how you want to plug it in. Yeah. So disappointed in myself for not catching that. Humongous error. Okay. Well, let's move on. So let's talk about envelopes. An envelope is a signal, uh, just like an oscillator, just like a noise generator. It's a signal that can run at the audio rate, the control rate, and it's basically a fully customizable shape. So sometimes, uh, I mean, you, you want a particular shape, and instead of having to hunt through various oscillators, and which, which is the right shape for this, just make it yourself. Make an envelope. Um, Typically, envelopes are used to control the amplitude of a sound. It's sort of their most common application. But you can also use an envelope to control the frequency of a filter, the frequency of an oscillator, the density of a granulator, all sorts of things. It's just sort of a custom shape. And there are three main classes that I like to introduce with envelopes. They are line, x-line, and env-gen. All right, so let's... Um, Take this function here. Bring it down here, and uh, we'll say um, we have a signal. It's a nice sine wave. Make it two channels, uh, and we'll say I want our envelope to be a line, 
the control rate line that goes from 1 to 0 over 0.2 seconds. And the easiest way to use this to control the amplitude of a sound is to just multiply it by the signal. Um, and we could just, just, just for clarity, let's plot the line. There it is. Couldn't be simpler. It's a line, and it goes from 1 to 0 over 0.2 seconds. And I'm plotting exactly 0.2 seconds of that signal, so we see the whole thing. And this will sound like this. Make a little louder, why don't we? Yeah, maybe if we're feeling a little uh, feisty, we can put uh, an expirand in here. An expirand is a eugen, and every time we uh, make a synth, it will pick a random value in this range. So now we can do... And we have arrived at the most uh, recognizable form of computer music known to humankind. Uh, all right, so at this point, I want to introduce the node tree, which is a little visualization of the processes that are on the server. And I'm going to rearrange some things a little bit. And I'm going to play a few more of these little beeps and boops. And you can see it's adding more and more to the server. And if you look at my green server numbers here, they they're slowly creeping upwards. Right? We were at below 1%, and now it's kind of hovering closer to 2 or 3. Uh, this would make more intuitive sense if there was no envelope and I was just turning on a sine wave and turning on a sine wave and, and just adding more. You'd hear that there's lots of processes that are alive. And just because you're using an envelope to fade it out from 1 to 0, it doesn't mean that these processes stop. They're just all outputting zeros now because they've all reached the end of their line and they're all being multiplied by 0. And so we have all of these processes on the server. This is uh, bad because eventually these silent processes will just accumulate and overwhelm our computer. So we're going to hit command period to clear all those away. The solution to this problem is uh, an argument called done action, which I'm going to skip ahead to. Uh, so a done action is a number, and the number we provide represents an action for the server to take when the eugen that contains that done action is done. Now you can go to the help file for done, and at the bottom, there's a table of values and the done action they represent. So the default is zero. Every eugen that has a done action has a default value of zero, which means do nothing when the eugen is finished. And that's exactly what the server was doing. It was saying, okay, just going to do nothing. And there are a lot of done actions, but I find myself 99.99% of the time using zero or two. Two says free the enclosing synth. Free, of course, means destroy, right? get rid of. So if we specify done action 2 and then run this again, the synth frees itself after it's done. And when we are using an envelope of some kind to control the total lifespan of a sound, Almost always, done action two is the appropriate thing to do because once the sound has finished, it's done. Right? So get it out of here. Like make space for other sounds. Um, but if done action is zero, then the synth just hangs around. Right? Any eugen that has a done action, line, x line, nth gen, there's others as well. Anything which is inherently finite is going to have a done action argument and. Um, it's sort of your responsibility to pick the correct done action so that you get the appropriate behavior from the server. Uh, all right, let's make this a little bit longer, maybe a second. And let's look at X line, keeping in mind that exponential number generation can't include zero, so this will fail to make sound. One of those mysterious problems where nothing is working and there's no error messages. This is just something you got to burn into your memories that 
exponential number generators and supercollider, you can't do zero, so you have to do something like this. And if it really bothers you that this doesn't actually end at zero, you can do this if you like. Um, of course, then it doesn't start at one, <laughs> but uh, it's, I, I, you know, if this ending value is close enough to zero, the ear will not notice that it doesn't actually go to full silence before disappearing. Now listen, listen, if you will, just to, uh, to the difference between line and X line. Right. And if we can go ahead and plot this, you'll see that it has a different shape. It's an exponential line. And you simply just want to use linear or exponential depending on the circumstances. And then with amplitude, um, when we reduce amplitude by half, that's six decibels. So six decibels and then half again is six decibels and half again is six decibels. Uh, and we have a logarithmic perception of signal level. So in this case, you can make the argument that an exponential line controlling amplitude has a more natural sound, a fade out, which sounds more natural. It's a very subjective thing to say, but with the um, with line, uh, it seems to have a pretty relatively consistent level until the very end when it suddenly disappears. It kind of gets vacuumed up at the end, and ultimately, this is of course just a matter of taste. It depends what kind of fade out you want. Uh, but that's how these two unit generators behave, X line and line, linear, exponential. But they're very, very simple. They can only have one segment, a start and an end and a duration. So this doesn't give us a lot of options for modeling more complex envelopes, like, you know, the kinds of sounds musical instruments make, things like that. Uh, so let's take a look at EnvGen. Uh, and to introduce envgen, we also need to introduce a class called env. Envgen is a unit generator. It's a, like SinOSC, like pink noise. It lives on the server. Env is a language side class that specifies a breakpoint envelope. Um, and the simplest way to make an envelope using env is to use env.new and provide a, an array of levels, an array of times, an array of curves. So if we were to let's draw, let's draw an envelope real quick. Let's just try to make a very simple envelope that looks like this. I meant to make this flat, but we're going to go with the flow here. So we'll say this is a value of 1, this is a value of 0 0.4, and maybe this is a value of 0 0.6. And we'll say uh, this is 0.5 seconds, 0.5 seconds, 2 seconds, 0.5 seconds. And we're just going to imagine that all these segments are straight lines. Right, so take a moment to uh, sort of mental snapshot of this shape here. Maybe I'll switch back to it. But so the levels are um, 0, 1, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0. I'm just reading them left to right in time. Okay, so those are our levels. Now our times: 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 2, 0 0.5. There's always one fewer time than points because they're lines that are used to connect points. So, And curves. Uh, in this case, a value of 0 means linear. Positive values will bend the segment in one direction, and negative values bend it in the other direction. For now, we'll just specify zeros for those curves. And let's go ahead and plot this envelope. There it is. So let's see what happens if we change a few things. Like if we make this first segment a value of 3, you can see it's bent that segment a little bit in that direction. Uh, if we make it negative, 
bends it in the other direction. Uh, we can shorten one of our segments. So now that one is only a tenth of a second. Um, we could also add more levels, but then we'd also have to add more times and curves. But any arbitrary shape, you just write it. It can be expressed with these three arrays of values. Question? If we have the incorrect number of levels, times, or curves, will it throw an error? I don't think so. If you have the wrong number of, well, let's find out. I, I do know that if you, um, I think what happens is it wraps shorter arrays as necessary. Okay. I mean, this is a perfectly valid thing to experiment with because we're not making any sound. Go ahead and put wacky numbers in here and, and just see what it does. Uh, if you do something like uh, this, what I believe is going to happen here is it's going to wrap the smaller array to fill in all the necessary spots. So I think it's going to say uh, this segment gets a zero, this one gets a four, this one gets a zero, this one gets a four. Mm, that looks like what it did. Yeah, here's a curve and here's a curve. Um, there's a lot of different options for curves. I think you can also specify things like sine, and then it will use a, a sort of sine segment, a sort of half cycle of a sine wave to do all of these. So this is all, uh, I'm sure this is in the envelope help file. Maybe it's in the end help file. Yeah, here they are. So different options for curve, step, hold, lin or linear, etc. So that's how we make an end. We can also omit this new method. Well, anything dot new can usually be just replaced with without the without the new. So let's let's do this, right? So we um, we want to make an, a control rate env gen, and an env gen needs a couple of things. Well, at, at minimum, it needs an instance of an env, which determines the shape of the signal. So we can just uh, we can take our this envelope here, and copy that in, and we should also provide a done action. Two makes sense because it's it's the life. This is the envelope that's going to be applied. Uh, so let's see what it sounds like. It's hard to hear that increase from 0.4 to 0.6, but it does get ever so slightly louder there. We could, we could make it a, a little more extreme like by doing this. Now the end will look like this. Uh, oh, I can't have plot here. That's not allowed. <laughs> when you plot an env, it becomes a different type of object. So have to get rid of that. Uh, oh, we got a lot of these, don't we? OK. Plot that one more time. Right. Make sense? It's a pretty basic way to do envelopes. And uh, Uh, so on, on the topic of envelopes, we can basically divide them into two categories, those that can be sustained indefinitely and those that can't. This is kind of true of, of musical instruments as well. Like a snare drum, you, yeah, you can do a snare drum roll. That's not really the same thing. You can't, or, you know, you can't sustain a piano note. You press a key on the piano, you can't sustain it. It just decays. That's all it does. Um, uh, but a bowed string, for example, you can, if you're really, if you're really quite good at your at your craft, you can do a seamless sustain, bowing back and forth, and the sound will never end until you lift the bow. So whether an env gen can be sustained or not depends on what kind of envelope is used to create it. So there are fixed duration envelopes and there are sustaining envelopes. And I'm going to simplify this a little bit. Uh, so. In the, um, actually, let's stick with env.new for just a second. Let's use env.new to make uh, an ADSR envelope, just a, a sort of classic envelope which uh, has an attack, a decay, and then it sustains at some level indefinitely, and then it has a release. 
Right, so attack, decay, sustain, release. And what we have to do is, in addition to the uh, levels, times, and curves, we have to specify a what's called a release node. And it's a point where the envelope will sustain for as long as it's allowed to sustain there. And it's sustained there through the use of an argument called a gate. And a gate is, I, I, I guess it's basically named after real world gates, where you can sort of hold them open and things can go through them until you shut the gate. Right? So in, in code, uh, a gate is a number. And it's one, when it's one, the gate is open. And the envelope will begin and sustain for as long as it stays there. And uh, when it's zero, it will continue uh, from that sustain point and decay. So that looks like this. So those are our levels. And we don't need to duplicate this one because it's just going to sustain at that value. You know, normally, an envelope would have a first sustain point and a last sustain point, but we just have the one point here. Uh, and then we need some attack. We'll make it pretty short, kind of medium short. Uh, the decay will be six tenths of a second. Uh, and then the release will be two seconds. And then we'll put some curve values. So we'll make this, uh, I don't know, negative three, negative one, uh, negative one. So there it is. You just have to imagine this point here uh, can be sustained in time indefinitely. And this release, this last segment, will get shifted over. So what we also need to do is specify this fourth argument in env.new, which is the release node. This is a number treated as an index into the env array. This is what we want our sustain value to be, and that has index 2 in the array. So the release node is 2. You know, and we can always be very verbose here if, if this is a style that makes more sense to you. Uh, get rid of this plot. And then we need a gate argument. We'll initialize gate to 1, which means the gate is open. The envelope will begin and sustain for as long as the gate remains positive. And when gate becomes 0, we continue on from that sustain point. And I have forgotten to do something here. Ah, I'm using a keyword here, which means I have to use keywords here as well. Right. Or we can just do away with... Keywords are probably really good from a teaching perspective. But I don't use them very often, which is, we'll put them in there. Why not? OK. So now I'm going to prepare this line of code here. We play. And it will sit here at an amplitude of 0.3 until we close the gate. Two second release. And done action two kicks in and freeze the synth. Right, just take, a, take five seconds, let this soak in. Right. Is this clear? OK. So if done action is two, and we let the envelope get all the way to the end, we can't do this, because the synth is gone. It is. It's like it never existed, so we can't open the gate again. But if done action is zero, then we can f uh, close the gate. And you'll notice that synth is still hanging around. So we can open the gate again right. as many times as we want. And it's never going to automatically free itself, so when we're actually done, we probably should actually free it. So this is one of the main questions when deciding which done action to use. You say, do I, when, this, when this finite ugen is finished, am I done with it forever? If so, done action two. Right? If not, if you're going to do something with it later, like you know, bring its amplitude back up or whatever, uh, it should have done action zero. Question? Will it have the, um, the same attack as it's previously specified whenever you open the gate again? Yes, this is a, yeah, the question, will it have the same attack when you open the gate again? 
let me see if I can explain the precise behavior of envelopes in respect to their, their gates. So, and I think a picture might be valuable here. All right, so let's say we have an envelope, you know, that sustains and releases. So gate becomes one, you know, and, and we move along. And so this value is changing over time. We're moving along this path, and it sustains. And uh, whenever uh, the gate becomes zero, and then becomes one again, and so once it, once it becomes zero, let's start there. So we're, we're moving along. If we set the gate to zero suddenly, like right here, it says, oh, OK, uh, I'm going to go from my current value to the value at the beginning of the release segment. So it will actually, uh, st well, no, no, I, sorry, I misspoke. It's going to go from this value to this value over this time using this curve, but it's gonna, this is going to be the starting value. That's, this is to prevent discontinuities. So you'll actually get a segment that looks kind of like this, right? It starts a little bit higher because that's where we were over here. So that's what happens if you set the gate to zero. Wherever you happen to be, it's going to go from there to the the segment, the, the point immediately following the release node over the release time with the release curve. And uh, if you are uh, somewhere in here, right, the gate has been set to zero and you're in the middle of the release phase and you suddenly set the gate to one again, it's going to go back to, if, if, um, it's going to go back to what's called the uh, loop node. So there's the release node which we've already talked about. And there's also the loop node. And by default, this is going to be the beginning of the envelope, node 0. Uh, but you can set it to be somewhere in the middle of the envelope as well. So if it's 0, uh, and the gate has been set to 0, and we're making our way down here, and we set the gate to 1, it's going to go from this value to the level immediately following the loop node. Right? Here's the loop node over that segment's duration and curve. So it's going to go from this value, this non-zero value, to this value over that duration. So it's going to do this kind of thing. Right? So again, it's with current location to the target segment, depending on whether the gate is being 1 or 0, uh, over that segment's duration using that segment's curve. I can, yes, go ahead. So this is to prevent like, the samples from having like, a large discrepancy at any given time. Right. What we don't want is if we're like somewhere up here, and we suddenly set the gate to zero, we don't want to snap down to here because we're going we're gonna to get a snappy, yucky click. Right? So that's, that's the point of this design. So if I, uh, I, can, I can demonstrate this, I think. If we set the gate to zero, and then if I set the gate to one, less than two seconds after that, you'll hear it'll ramp back up uh, from its current value, wherever that happens to be, to this value over 0 0.05 seconds using this curve. And here we go. You can't really tell. It's a little hard to tell. It doesn't actually go back to zero and then up to one. It goes from its current value up to one. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Right. Sure. How did you figure out this behavior? I think it's actually in the help file. Oh, cool. It's, uh, I forget if it's in nth gen or env, but I'm pretty sure there is some language in one or both of those help files that explains, uh, yeah, I think it's right here. Uh, when released, a looping envelope will move from its current position to the node that immediately follows release node and continue until the end. Yeah, but you know, there's a lot of words in these help files, so I don't, I don't blame you for not, you know, being able to find that uh, yourself. Yeah. <clears throat> now, uh, let's let's uh, let's switch gears and let's go back to a a finite duration envelope. Uh, so, let me. Why do I get the feeling that I'm not going to get through everything today? <laughs> All right. So let's let's do um, a sort of fixed duration envelope. Something uh, like this. Okay. A little percussive shape. And. We'll give it a gate. Doesn't have a, it, and we'll, we've taken away the release node, so it doesn't sustain. So in this case, the gate is just used as, the, as a trigger. Like if you're familiar with Max MSP, it's like a bang. It's just a little 
instantaneous message that says, do your thing. Right? Start it and just go and live your life. Uh, and so now this is going to sound, oops, got to take this away. Right. Oh, I think I have an extra one kicking around here. Let's press command period. Right. There it is. And so now we might want to say uh, gate one, right? And say, okay, do it again. It doesn't work because we have to have to set the gate to zero and then set it to one. We can't just set it to 1 again because it's already 1, right? We're, we have a signal that's hovering at 1, and we're saying, become 1. And it's like, oh, yeah, I am 1. You know? So we actually have to. And this is um, annoying, right? You don't have to do two discrete steps, right, in order to just to re-trigger a fixed duration envelope. The solution here involves declaring a special type of argument called a uh, trig control. Normally, when we declare an argument, it becomes an instance of uh, control. It's a special eugen that allows us to influence it from outside. And trig control is like a normal argument, except whenever you set it to a non-zero value, it stays at that value for exactly one control cycle, and then snaps back to zero. Whereas regular arguments, you set them to a value, they stay at that value until you set them to something else. So trig controls are really useful for declaring an argument and getting it to behave like a trigger, where you set it, it sets itself, and then jumps back to zero, and it's ready to be set again. And there's a couple different ways to do this, um, but one of those ways is to precede the argument name with a T underscore. And this, this is a, a special prefix that internally tells the server, hey, this is a trig control, it's not a regular argument. Uh, so. Now we can we have to change this as well to T gate. And then we play. And we can set T gate to be one as many times as we like. Right? If we do it, you know, really fast, it's not even gonna get a chance to decay and it's gonna kinda sound like it's just hovering up there near its peak level. It's the same behavior as before, right? Wherever it happens to be, when we re-trigger an envelope. It goes from its current value to the node immediately following the loop node, which is the beginning of the envelope by default. I know I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you, right? Envelopes are kind of one of the more complicated unit generators, but you are going to use them constantly. So it's really good to get comfortable. Um, now, if this were done action two, uh, and we play this, uh, if we're not quick enough, Okay, I got it that time. I can hold it open, but as soon as I let it get to its end, it's gone. Right? So if an envelope gets to its end and done action is two, poof, poof it goes. Right? And you can't trigger it, and you have to actually make it again, right? Okay, there we go. <laughs> All right, so that's, that's envelopes in a nutshell. Um, I'm going to start with multi-channel expansion. We don't have a lot of time left today, but I do want to start with uh, multi-channel signals and multi-channel expansion. We've already been doing this a little bit right here. The bottom line with multi-channel signals is that the server interprets an array of signals as a multi-channel signal, and it will try to assign the different channels of audio in that multi-channel signal to consecutive numbered output channels. So that means if you send a two-channel signal to the left speaker, it will send the other channel to the right speaker. Uh, let's, uh, I'll do s.options. I'm going I'm to reconfigure the server just a little bit. 24. Okay. So now I'm imagining that I have 24 speakers, uh, an audio interface that can do 24 simultaneous outputs, and if I open the meters, we, sure enough, we have 24 channels of output here. Where is he going with this? Who knows? All right. So uh, let's make uh, a pink noise signal with a low amplitude. We're going to play it. And we're going to use exclamation point two to create an array of these two signals. And I'm going to bring this. Uh, down, oops, uh, let's see, let's just do it this way. You come down here, 
and you go over there. Okay, so if we play this with two channels, I can make four channels. We're only hearing two because right now this, this the classroom audio system is set up for just two channels. I can do 24 and we get 24 channels. Right? Uh, and so what this does is it, you know, if I, if I evaluate this in the post window, you see it's an array of 24 binary operation UGENs. It's just a, it's just a sort of class under the hood. It's basically 24 pink noises. Um, we can do this with any, any signal. Um, and if we do something like this, Ah, so you see what's happening here. We're providing an array of argument numbers, of, of, of values, which are being supplied for the mull argument of pink noise. And this, what's happening here is something called multi-channel expansion. We provide an array of numbers as an argument for a UGEN. The UGEN responds by expanding itself into an array of that many UGENs with the individual argument values distributed to individual UGENs. And so here's Point zero one, two, four, eight, etc. Right. And you'll notice that we're not hearing anything, right? Because only zero and one are actually channels that are connected to speakers. Right? I'd have to it'd be a different situation if I had an interface and some way of encoding twenty four channels of audio into a screen recording video. So it's this is really just for visual demonstration purposes. All right, so that's that's multi channel expansion. Uh, there's an interesting thing that happens here with stochastic unit generators, i.e. those that are random or you know, not, not deterministic. Um, if we make a unit generator like pink noise, which is a, ultimately a random number generator of some kind, and we apply duplication to the unit generator, you can see we get exactly the same signal in both channels. If we duplicate the argument, this means uh, the server will say, OK, I got to make one of these, and I got to make another one, and I'm going to put 0.1 in this one and 0.1 in that one. So two unique pink noise generators are created. You can see the two channels are different. This is a very subtle but important behavior to be aware of. Now, if we're doing sine waves, it doesn't matter because this is a deterministic signal. It's, it's always, if you say sine OSC 200, it's always going to do exactly the same thing. So it doesn't matter if we expand one of these arguments. We could do it to this one. That doesn't matter. And we can expand the UGEN itself. All the same thing. Right? That's because this is a deterministic UGEN. Pink noise and LF noise 1 and 2 and all those, those are stochastic. Those are random. And so if an argument is duplicated, we make unique copies. If the UGen is duplicated, it makes an exact copy of the original UGen. And the, I think the last thing I want to say, well, I guess there's two more things. Uh, one is that you want to be careful to only duplicate when it is appropriate to do so. So for example, if we say, let's make a two channel 200 hertz sine wave. And then we'll say sig equals sig times uh, 0.1. And then we're going to send it out. So we'll say, OK, well, we better multi-channel expand this so we hear two channels. Uh, this is bad. Um, if we, uh, if we uh, post ln this, uh, what did I do now? Oh, I just need one of those. Yeah. And let's actually just put silence at the end here. The thing that is being produced with this double dose of duplication is an array of two things, each of which is an array of two things. So we've created a multi-dimensional array here. And what I think happens here is that these two signals get mixed together and sent to the left speaker, and these get mixed and sent to the right. A better example is uh, something like this. Maybe, where we have a, 
like this. And so here we'll have uh, pink noise in the left, sine wave in the right. And if we say sig equals sig x clam 2, yeah. So our, our stereo image here, if you can call it that, is ruined uh, because we wanted to have one signal over here, one signal over there, but instead we have Uh, this, this is basically a pink noise, sine osc, pink noise, sine osc. And yeah, SuperCollider sees this outer array and says, okay, it's got two things. Here's the first thing. Uh, this is also an array. I guess I'll just add everything together and send that to the left speaker and add these and send it to the right speaker. So this is something I see quite frequently. You just have to remember once you either use exclamation point two or you actually construct an array, this signal is a multi-channel signal. Even though it looks like just one thing, it's a multi-channel signal. So any further attempt to uh, multi-channel expand it will produce bogus results. Uh, similar if you, uh, uh, just another example here. Uh, I won't even play this one, just to give you some, you know, pseudo code here. Like uh, if we want to pan this signal slightly to the left, even though there's no exclamation point two and there's no array brackets, the output of pan 2 is a two-channel signal. So again, this is the same problem. You're multi-channel expanding a signal that is already a multi-channel signal. Did you have a question? Um, okay. Okay. Uh, gosh, I, um, I've taught this class in the past, and I feel like I always go too fast, which is why I'm really trying to take my time here. I don't want to rush through things, because I know it's incredibly new for some of you. Um, so uh, I'll stick around after class if you have any questions, and I think we'll, we'll talk about synth and synthdef, uh, a few extra server tools next week, and then I think we're just going to start diving into some creative applications. Right? We'll do some sampling, we'll do some synthesis, we'll do some effects, we'll do some other cool stuff. I just, uh, I just want you all to be really comfortable with the basics of building synthesis functions, doing math with signals, plugging unit generators into other unit generators, booting the server, playing, and all that sorts of basic manipulations. So, uh, I guess I'll, I'll see you all next week.